for coming today. It means a lot to us, even if it's just to listen to what we have to say and, you know, at the end. So basically today we're going to have a little opening ceremony by Julie, that's what mm -hmm. you said. And then we're going to have a presentation, which is called a talk. It's been given in many cities around the world. It originated in the UK. And after that, we're going to have a little chapter on all the climate anxiety, climate grief, what we feel about this whole everything that's happening in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And the third chapter of our today's presentation is uh, Extinction Rebellion. We're going to talk a little bit about this particular organization, what they do, and how it is one sort. It's not suited for everyone, but for some, this might be a way like to help with this whole anxiety grief as a way of action because a lot of times we're just stuck and we feel empowered you know like powerless and this might help so thank you for the opening thank you so much yeah Dave and i were at a workshop not that long ago about saving the water, protecting the water, looking after Mother Earth. And we were there for about a good four hours mm -hmm. doing the workshop and, and coming up with ideas and thoughts and, I, and strategies in order to try to start working on saving the water. And when I was there, I always have to have something that inspires me. And so then I ended up writing this. And I asked David to be all right if I shared it tonight with everybody. And I even wrote a segue because I thought it was important to be able to have something. So I wrote this. We as Indigenous people have our climate change warriors. Some fight for the rights of the water, bringing awareness to the public of the state of our land and our water. We have our land protectors who fight against the fracking, the pipelines, and many other areas. They give up weeks of sitting at home with their families, and some have their well-being and safety threatened by the work that they do. We have allies, we have supporters, who have hearts that are big enough to fight for a future that includes a healthy earth for all of us. Now that was my segue. And when I was thinking of the earth, I was thinking of all the gifted speakers that I've been hearing in the last little while, and how they've described earth. And to me, earth is a presence. In Mi'kmaq, it's osiskamu. It means earth. Now, when I think of earth, I think of her as some of a relative that we have to look after and protect. So when I wrote this, this was what was in my mind. Our earth is our home, where we all live. She is also like our mother, who gave us life. We come from the earth and we return to the earth. The ground, the earth is her flesh, nurturing us and helping us to live and grow. The grass is her hair, waving this way and that in the wind. The water is her blood, keeping her healthy and strong. When we lose any part of her, we risk our own lives. We need to protect her, stand up for her, and ensures that she stays safe for many, many generations to follow us. And when I was thinking about that, I had a discussion at work today about how we view the world. Now, a lot of Western ideas have always been the pyramid, where there is somebody with the greatest amount of power at the top, trickles down to the next amount, and it goes larger and larger and larger, and then it's the people. First Nations people have circular ideas in terms of that. Everybody is equal. We are all on that same circle. We have to look out for each other, and we have to look out for the ones around us that can't. The earth, the animals, the air, the water, all those things are our responsibility. Now I'm thinking I'm gonna share a song. Now this one, I think, because I'm looking at all these women and all these women, and I think Strong Woman Song is a good one to sing tonight. The Strong Woman Song was written in 1970, and this song was written by a group of indigenous and non-indigenous women who lived in Kingston Penitentiary solitary confinement at the time that they wrote this. 
When they wrote this, the living conditions were horrendous there, and many of them didn't come as mentally sane and able to move forward. But these, this group of women, they all sat there in their cells and started to sing, to tap the song first. And then once they got the beat, the words slowly came. And they shared that song when they got it, and they call this a song of healing and a song of strength. It's not just for the women, it's for the men who are there supporting them as well. So they skew it to make it seem less uh, threatening, to make an excuse for the fact that they're doing nothing. Okay. So this is the title, The Oncoming Climate Emergency and What We Can Do About It, about climate anxiety and climate action. Now, many people are in this, and this is uh, 
Thank you very much. I wasn't, I didn't know you were coming for sure, and so I was so glad. Uh, so this is a, an acknowledgement. I would, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which we gather is a traditional and unceded territory of the Abitwit Mi'kmaq First Nation, and the land upon which we gather is shrinking, okay? This is especially true of the territory of the Lennox Island Mi'kmaq uh, First Nation. Let us hold them in our hearts, because they are losing, there's a good chance that within 20 years or so, the majority of their, of their island will be gone. They'll have to, most of them will have to move. We think of that as happening in the Pacific, right? The Pacific Island nations. But here is an Atlantic Island nation that is threatened. Okay, this is a quote from, there's a book that was put out by Extinction Rebellion. You can find it on the internet. It's uh, like a handbook called this is not a drill, and this is a lovely quote, I think. We refuse to bequeath a dying planet to future generations by failing to act now. We act in peace and with ferocious love for these lands in our hearts. We act on behalf of life. Climate change is not simply a matter of cause and effect. It's more like a vicious circle. This is the feedback loops which you've probably heard about. One of the most dangerous is this one called the Albedo effect. Have people heard of this? This is the fact that ice is much more reflective than water. I mean you can see here the water is almost black. The ice is very white and reflective. That means that solar energy is reflected back into space by ice, but it is absorbed by the dark water. So the more this happens, the more ice melts, which means that there's a greater surface of dark water, which means that there's more water heating, which means that the ice melts faster, which means that there's more water, more darkness, less ice. And so at this rate, the ice is disappearing. This shows the IPCC models. Now this is one thing that people uh, who aren't really reading the whole report might not understand, but the IPCC deals with many different models. They take hundreds of different scientific surveys, studies, scientific data, and they apply many different models for projecting into the future, right? Ares, like, uh, mathematical models. And so you will always have like a spread from the, uh, the most conservative to the most threatening. You see, so this is what all the models in the report, we're talking about hundreds of models, they form this spread into the future. Now this here, the red, are the actual observations of the ice, the amount of ice, okay? Here you see that it's going down much, much faster than any of the models have predicted. Now you might have heard uh, in the news recently that this summer the ice, not just on the ocean, but the ice in Greenland, in those gigantic mile deep glaciers, is melting at a rate hundreds of times faster than was predicted. So this is something that is happening and it's much more extreme than we're being told. If you look into the scientific literature, you'll find it. But of course, most people don't do that. So, um, this is something that uh, Roger Hallam, who's one of the founders of uh, Extinction Rebellion, it compares it to. Like people, and <coughs> The, the media gives you the idea that it's extremely complicated, this whole idea of climate change. Because they talk about this and that and the other thing, the albedo effect, the methane, the, uh, the warming of the sun, greenhouse gases, uh, the escape of methane from fracking, <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide coming from automobiles and from the tar sands and all this sort of thing. It seems so, so complicated. 
but he comp compares it to going to the doctor when you, your foot hurts, your arm hurts, you've got horrible headaches, and it's all very complicated. But the fact is you actually have, also have lung cancer. Right? Suddenly, things are very simple. Right? You have advanced lung cancer. The, matter, the fact that your foot hurts or whatever, it suddenly fades into the background. So the, the planet right now has a case of what you might call lung cancer in the sense that the, there, all of these things are combining to, uh, to cause the likelihood of extremely high levels of, of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, extreme warming. So, this is what the IPCC report said. Less than 12 years to make significant change. Uh, the latest science in the IPCC says that uh, have to reduce emissions by 40% in the next 12 years to avoid catastrophe. And yet in 2018, emissions went up from an increase of 1.6% in 2017 to an increase of 2.7%. Thus, it is not alarmism to suggest that this is catastrophic. And let's unpack the word catastrophe beyond its abstract meaning. We are looking here at slow and agonizing suffering and death for billions of people because the areas of the world that produce the most food, that produce the grains upon which we live, something like 90% of all the food that humans eat come from four grains, basically. Wheat, corn, uh, rice, and, well, a few others. But basically, the three are the most. Most of the calories we eat come from that. You might call potatoes a grain. <laughs> so anyway, the, cons the consensus model underestimates the problem. And here's a sort of graphic representation of it. This is the usefulness of sources of information. Okay? A scientist, this is coming from Britain, so it uses British uh, uh, colloquialism. A, a scientist's opinion down in the pub, right? What the scientist says is eh, maybe useful. A single scientific peer-reviewed paper, well, that has more, more validity. It's more uh, useful. A review of a specific area has even more. And in the IPCC panel is taking all of it together. So in some ways, it's very uh, reliable in the sense that it has the most <laughs> data. But one problem is that, as I said before, it tends to be uh, conservative because of the fact it's not just the scientists who are contributing, it's also the, uh, the national governmental bureaucrats who are pushing it to reduce the, uh, the threat, the, the apparent threat. The threat's still there. <laughs> okay, so you have cherry picking the worst case scenarios, which would be alarmist. You have uh, the key papers and the latest data, which this talk is based on, which is useful. Or in the extreme, on the other end, the, the uh, IPCC data, which is uh, politicized. Okay. Oops. And, okay. Okay, basically, these things are undeniably happening. Okay, these are aspects of the, uh, the climate catastrophe that are contributing to the increasing temperature. The Arctic is melting, which we uh, mentioned before. 75% of sea ice in the Arctic has melted in the last 30 years. In the summertime, at, at the nadir, at the, when there's uh, the least ice, it's 75% less than it was 30 years ago. We don't know the effect of this on the Gulf Stream. Like, the Gulf Stream is part of the great Atlantic, um, what's it called? Escalator or something? I don't remember. Anyway, it, there is a um, like a circuit of water. The cold water comes from up north, from like between uh, Greenland and Baffin Island, and comes down in the Labrador Current and sinks down under the Atlantic Ocean, going all the way down to the South Atlantic by Africa, and warms up and then comes up through the Caribbean and then to the Gulf Stream to here. That's why we have nice beaches. 
That's why people like, prefer to go to Cavendish than to go to Old Orchard in Maine, because it's much colder there, because we have the Gulf Stream. But the thing is, this is dependent on that difference, on the coldness of the Arctic water coming down, being uh, having that, uh, that gradient of difference between cold and warm, which causes it to move. So we don't know what's going to happen. Some people do worry that it could stop, which could, we don't know exactly what would happen. It might cause an ice age in Europe. Like uh, Scotland and Norway are extremely far north, much more farther north than we are. And so, who knows, there might be another ice age up there. So, this is a, another quote from Roger Hallam. A moral analysis might go like this. A recent scientific opinion stated that 5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial mean temperature, we are looking at an ecological system incapable of sustaining, or sorry, capable of sustaining just 1 billion people. That means 6 to 7 billion people will have died in the next generation or two. Even if this figure is wrong by 90%, that means that 600 million people face starvation and death in the next 40 years. This is 12 times worse than the death toll of civilians and soldiers of World War II, and many times the death toll of every genocide known in history. This is what governments around the world are willingly allowing to happen. There is no greater crime. Let us bear this reality in mind as we address the questions of the necessary strategic response. And I say it's a crime, and the thing is, we have all heard the expression, the crime against humanity, right? And it's used in a metaphorical sense. It's a crime against our sense of humanity, of humaneness, you might say. But we're talking here about a crime against all of humanity. It's a literally a crime against humanity. And what it could bring about is the fifth or the sixth major extinction in the billion or so years that the Earth has been here. There have been five major extinctions. The one that's the most famous is the one that was caused by a meteorite that killed the dinosaurs. But the other four were all caused by uh, increases in carbon dioxide. So it is the most common kind of uh, extinction. And the Permian Triassic extinction, there were methane releases, as we were hearing might happen with the, the north and the permafrost, that wiped out 97% of all life. So all life on Earth is the progeny of that 3% that managed to survive. This is, this is just uh, very hard to, to take in. So, uh, Professor Jem Bendel is a professor of sustainability leadership, or he actually was, uh, at the University of Cambria. Uh, he took a year off uh, sabbatical uh, to do research into climate, and wrote a paper called Deep Adaptation. And he's, uh, he's gone on a permanent sabbatical, I think, because he'd spent his whole career teaching people how to have sustainable systems, like uh, sustainable uh, agriculture and things like that. And he, he came to the conclusion that it was useless. Now, this might be... Um, you know, there are many people who don't necessarily follow his, uh, his opinion. He is like at the other end. You could say the IPCC is at the conservative end, saying, well, you know, if we handle things right, we can, we can fix it. He's basically saying there's no way. He's basically saying extreme heat in the tropical and semi-tropical zones causes agriculture collapse, which causes famine, which causes societal collapse. And that this is inevitable, and he feels it will come soon. Immense catastrophe is very likely. Human extinction possible. Other life extinction is already happening. Right? We know that 
hundreds of, of uh, species become extinct every year, or even thousands. He presented his climate science data at a talk in September of 2018, uh, which you can find on the internet, by the way. He's a very good speaker. Uh, which shows possible mechanism leading to collapse in three years, he's talking about. Now, for me, uh, I find it plausible that this might happen, but I think it's sort of, it's on, the, on one of the tails, right? Because in, in probability, you probably know that uh, we generally look at it as being a sort of a curve, you know, the bell-shaped curve. And I would say that his, uh, his predictions are definitely possible, but they're not the most likely. But we should keep it in mind. We should be getting up to date on a nightly basis on the news. This is what he's saying. He's saying, why don't we know about this? Why aren't we hearing about all of the, uh, the studies, all of the science out there? Why on the media will they put up some crank who's one of three climate scientists in the world who doesn't believe this? and put them in a, sense, in a false equivalence that, oh, is there climate change or is there not climate change? As, as if these were equally valid. And 90, more than 97% of all climate scientists agree that climate change is here and it's caused by human interaction with the ecology. So another aspect of this is loss of ecological diversity. Wildlife is dying out due to habitat destruction, overhunting, toxic pollution, invasion by alien species, and climate change. I was uh, part of a group, were you, Julie, at the, the, the group when um, the Climate Lab was presenting in the Mi'kmaq Confederation? Yes. Yeah. And so they're doing a study and they're recruiting uh, amateur scientists to uh, make note of the changes in the flora and fauna. Like when you see uh, flowers or birds or any kind of organism that normally doesn't show up, to see how the climate change is, is uh, progressing. And it is progressing. One example that is uh, kind of scary for us is Lyme disease, right? Ticks with Lyme disease are coming, if not here. I don't know how many cases there have been on the island, but I don't think many. No. None yet? No. Of people? But they're coming. Yeah. You mean of people? Yeah. Oh. Because my dog got it. Yeah. The yeah. dogs are getting it, so that means it's here. So it's just a matter of, matter of time. Yeah, my dog is uh, vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, we just got the vaccine. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So species endangered include one in four mammals one in eight birds, and one third of all amphibians, and 75, 70 percent of the world's assessed plants are endangered. From 1970 to 2014, half of monitored wildlife species in Canada declined in the virus. That's the World Wildlife Fund. There are only about 450 northern right whales left. They are critically endangered. This strikes me personally because my, uh, my great-grandfather was a whaler, so I feel a little bit responsible. And another of my uh, ancestors was a, uh, an officer in the uh, Buffalo Soldiers against, in the wars against uh, the Indians in the west of the United States. So I've got a lot to make up for. <laughs> Okay, so this is scary stuff. It's not comfortable to hear it, to actually hear it, to really feel it is very uncomfortable. And many of us are having sort of vague feelings, like we don't allow ourselves to actually concentrate on it enough to feel it very intensely. But it's like a miasma. It's, it's, it's like you'll hear something on the radio or you see it on the TV and you go, oh God, I think I'll go get a, something to drink or something. <laughs> and 
So it's something that is contributing to a sense of anxiety in a lot of people. And for some people, it's become extremely acute. Right? A good example of that is Greta Thunberg. I think, has everybody heard of Greta? The uh, Swiss girl? Swedish. Swedish, thank you. I misspoke. Yes, Swedish. She actually uh, has, her growth has been stunted because of the fact she had a long period of anorexia where she would not eat uh, during a time when most girls are having growth spurts. And uh, she finally started eating again when she decided to do her, uh, her school strike. So this has been a great therapeutic action for her. Your grief is welcome here. Now, many of us, especially uh, us uh, old white guys, have been taught that we're not supposed to uh, feel or let anybody see that we feel this kind of thing. But grief is not a disorder. It's not a disease. It's not a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. The price you pay for love. The only cure for grief is to grieve. Now, I'm experiencing something uh, very uh, intense right now, personally, because uh, yesterday, while I was preparing this, um, I learned that my daughter, my daughter's lump is malignant in her breast, and it's also spread to uh, her lymph node in her, uh, under her arm. So, um, yeah, I can really relate to grief. In a way, this is what you might call a uh, anticipatory grief, right? And that, and that's what this is about too, right? Even though we are seeing things happen around us here, I mean, on the island so far, we don't have people close to us dying from the uh, effects of climate change, but we have trouble imagining what the future will bring, and we grieve for what we will lose, or what we fear we will lose. And so this to me just came rushing uh, at me yesterday, and still is with me. And I hope I'm not burdening people with this, but uh, it's something that I, I, I have to grieve. I mean, I don't think she'll necessarily die young, but there's that possibility. So I'm asking that we uh, have a little silence and look within ourselves to the feelings we have around this, which might be uh, sadness, it might be anger, it might be fear. Just take a moment, watch your breath, and feel the feelings that come in relation to what we've been talking about.
So, I was feeling uh, a lot of sadness and anger. Anyone else willing to share just a brief description if you want to? I understand that you don't feel like it. It's kind of personal. Yes, Ramona? I got confusion. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Yes? Uh, I felt sadness was the first thing that came up, but also a lot of fear and anger and shock. And then I also felt gratitude for all the people who are working on this problem. Thank you, Mel. Okay. This is a uh, picture which unfortunately is cut off, that appeared uh, last March, I think it was, when the um, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, which is huge, uh, they had shut down several of the circuses, uh, like giant roundabouts that are in the city of London. And one morning, people woke up and found this here, which is uh, by Banksy. Have you heard of Banksy? Yes. The artist who like just shows up and does things and doesn't sign. Them. And uh, it's it's cut off a little bit. It says, "From this moment, despair ends." and tactics begin. Okay. And this is the symbol for Extinction Rebellion, the hourglass. So I uh, have been, I'm a retired psychologist, and uh, for the last uh, oh, 10, 12 years of my practice, I was using a, a technique, a school called uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or counseling, which is very consistent with the ideas that, uh, that Extinction Rebellion is using about how we can sit with and learn to feel how we react to these horrible uh, facts and then move on to, uh, to act, to commit to act, and this in itself is therapeutic. The uh, acronym for the uh, therapy is ACT, ACT. Okay, it's an evidence-based approach and there's hundreds of studies showing its effectiveness for many different kinds of problems. Uh, dealing with stress, trauma, and normal anxiety. It's used to treat psychological disorders, but also an effective tool to help anyone dealing with stress and trauma. Prolonged stress can overwhelm coping resources, leading people to seek mental health care. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act is an intervention that enhances well-being and reduces distress, assumedly by means of increasing psychological flexibility. The examine the association between total increase in, in uh, psychological flexibility during intervention and decreases in stress and increases in well-being and after the uh, intervention. So, um, the idea is that a normal reaction to a lot of different kinds of stress is avoidance. But avoidance does not really help us to deal with uh, the source of the distress that we feel. And it basically causes us to do things that are not helpful, sometimes very counterproductive. But if we can, by uh, learning ways of sitting with our, uh, our thoughts and feelings, we can learn to accept the reality of what's happening and then commit to act in a way that is in accordance with our own personal values and that this is therapeutic. Okay? 
Acceptance is being with and exploring one's thoughts and feelings and physical sensations in the moment through the use of mindfulness techniques. Noticing reactions to those and accepting those reactions. Becoming aware that one is observing the thoughts, etc., and thus is separate from them. This is, can be a huge um, realization for people. You know, people define themselves according to uh, the thoughts in their heads and the feelings that they have, the emotions that they have, and don't see that these are things that are going on within them. It's that you are not your thoughts and feelings, that your thoughts and feelings happen within you. And by just making this slight uh, change of perspective, they can lose a lot of the power that they have over you. And by practicing what we call self-compassion, this also comes from pulling yourself a little bit away so that you can look at yourself, see how you're feeling, and feel compassion for yourself, which is very healthy. So the other half is commitment, and one part of that is to analyze your values. These are some ways to look at simple questions that can help you to, uh, to define what are your values. What people do you admire or uh, consider role models? What are some common qualities of the people you, I admire? What is one value that I would be willing to die for if I had to? What are the top three roles in life? Like, for example, I don't know, entrepreneur, student, worker, uh, doctor, husband, mother, daughter. What value would you place before each of those roles? Okay. What motivates me? What, what gets me going? What brings me the most joy, satisfaction, and pleasure? What am I interested in? What do I want more than anything else in my life? Like the culture is telling us that what we want are, is stuff, right? We want money and stuff, and we want admiration, perhaps. But when you look deeply into yourself, you usually find that these are not what you want. So commitment. The second part of it is to commit to and act according to, to act according to these values. Okay, to say, okay, well, what can I do that is in accordance with these values today, now, and then do it. Right. Now it sounds, uh, I'm oversimplifying, it's not always easy for people, but it is that uh, simple in the sense of this is what can help people to be able to deal with overwhelming stress. Extinction Rebellion now has three demands. I'm sort of changing subject here, going to Extinction Rebellion. The first is governments must tell the truth about climate and wider ecological emergency reverse inconsistent policies, and work alongside media to communicate with citizens. Okay? They're not doing that now. But we are demanding that they will. Governments must enact legally binding policy measures to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025. People say it's impossible. But I say, let's try. I say they thought it was impossible to get to the moon in 10 years, but the U.S. did it. And a citizen's assembly to oversee the changes as part of creating a democracy fit for purpose. Now, uh, these demands are, you know, you could say, well, you can sit there by yourself and demand that it's not going to do any good. But the tactics that were referred to in that painting are what will or what might are most probable to give the pressure on governments and the media to actually make the changes. And the tactic is what we call non-violent direct action, also known as civil disobedience. So, all over the world, people are doing things that are disruptive. Not violent, but disruptive. You might have heard of what they did in London. Like they blocked five, the five most busy bridges uh, across the Thames River for a whole day. They blocked 
the, these big circuses in downtown London at another time for a week. They brought in boats and put them in the middle and had thousands of people and they had big parties in the middle of the street, which of course stopped all the traffic. Um, and people were arrested. Now a part of this tactic, or the strategy that with this tactic is a part, is that the authorities will react. Right? They will arrest people, most likely. And that is a part of the strategy. But, and it's been shown all around the world, even in dictatorships, where, where they actually shoot at crowds, that if there are enough people, the statistics say, uh, if there's at least three or three and a half percent of the population that are uh, part of the resistance or rebellion, or whatever you want to call it, the people power, that the even the most violent regime will fall. So what happens is, people go out, they show that they're willing to sacrifice something, their freedom, sometimes their life. I'm not thinking that will happen here. And the fact that they, the state overreacts and people, uh, people, the general public begins to see that as unjust. And they begin, uh, they begin to sympathize with the, the rebellion. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this happens all over the world. It's, there's no guarantee that it will happen. But it's the one way that's most likely to get an entrenched system to change. So this is the, the, the way that they do it. Um, and it's what happened with the, the civil rights movement in the South. People calmly and in a disciplined way, they marched, they were arrested, some of them were beaten, but the, the whole country, or most of the country, suddenly saw the injustice of what was going on. And so there was change. Same thing with the suffragettes. The suffragettes used the same, the same techniques. They went out and broke simple laws, you know, like disturbing the peace or whatever, and got arrested. And they were seen as a higher moral authority. Same thing happened in India with Mahatma Gandhi, his uh, Satyagraha movement. This is the way that you can do what seems otherwise to be impossible. By getting enough people together that it creates a mass movement. Now I'm not saying necessarily we're going to be able to do this on the island, but we can show our solidarity with other places where it's happening, and perhaps, who knows, we can have an effect. But even more important than that, we can live our lives doing what we know is the right thing to do. We can be on the right side of history. We can look at our grandchildren, if we have them, and say, I'm not responsible, I mean, or I'm less responsible than most people for the, what's happened. You know, I've worked against it. I fought against it. I was part of that group. And so you can live your life in a way that you can be proud. Like, like the warriors, uh, the indigenous warriors fighting against the uh, American, against my great granduncle. <laughs> I'm not proud of him for that. Anyway, uh, yeah, the citizen assembly is the idea of having, uh, using the technique of true democracy, which actually was the original democracy. You see, democracy means rule by the poor, literally, rule by the mass, by the people. And the original democracy in Athens was not by election. It was by what they call sortition. It was a lottery. You were, you drew a lot that said that you would be in the people's assembly. 
whether you were a plumber, a homeless person, a banker, or a general. And this meant that the government actually was representative of the people in the sense of a representative sample like we use in, uh, in psychology or other social sciences. It was randomly selected, so it was representative. Not in the way it is now, where you're selected by how much money you can get from rich people. Not for women. Hmm? Not for women. Well, that's even less so. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, yeah, even if you have money, as a woman, you're less likely, you're saying. Well, I'm saying that women in every democracy. Oh, no, no. No women and no, no foreigners, no slaves. I'm not saying it was perfect. It was not perfect. No women, no foreigners, no slaves. And there were a lot of slaves. Yeah, actually. So, but the, the, uh, the thing is that this way you do, uh, I mean, nowadays, we wouldn't exclude women, I hope. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting uh, distracted here. Okay, so the principles are, we have a shared vision of change, creating a world that is fit for generations to come. We set our mission uh, on what is necessary, mobilizing three and a half percent of the population to achieve system change by using ideas such as momentum-driven organizing. We need a regenerative culture that is creating a culture that is healthy, resilient, and adaptable. We openly challenge ourselves and this toxic system, leaving our comfort zones to take action for change. We value reflecting and learning, following a cycle of action, reflection, learning, and planning for more action. Okay, I think I... Uh... Yeah, we welcome everyone and every part of everyone working actively to create safer and more accessible spaces. We actively mitigate for power, breaking down the hierarchies of power for more equitable participation. We avoid blaming and shaming. We live in a toxic system, but no one individual is to blame. We are a non-violent network, using non-violent strategy and tactics as the most effective way to bring about change. We are based on autonomy and decentralization. We collectively create the structures we need to challenge power. Anyone who follows these core principles and values can take action in the name of XR. So that means that if you are become a part of an XR group like XRPEI, you don't have to take orders and do what anyone tells you to do in doing this action or that action. You can make your own actions as long as they're consistent with these basic principles. So this is something that's hard to understand because most organizations are so hierarchical, people will assume that somebody who comes up with an idea is giving them directions or orders. Uh, I find it's very often uh, a source of uh, friction. Okay, here are some groups on the island working uh, to mitigate climate change that I know of. You can add some more if you know of them. Extinction Rebellion, of course. Council of Canadians, which I also work with. 350.org, which is not really much on the island, but uh, in Canada and in, in uh, the world. Is that the youth group? Uh, three feet, no, that's, that's a group, uh, in fact, um, oh, what's his name, Clayton Thomas, probably know him, Cree, oh. he's giving a talk, uh, oh, anyway, it's, it's a group founded by Bill McKibben, who you might have heard of, who's uh, written several important books, and is a commentator on climate change, uh, and, uh, it's, they're doing a lot of really good work all over uh, all over North America. Uh, Lead Now, you might have heard of them. That's another progressive group. They're uh, pushing. They're trying to push elected officials. Uh, the Green Party and the NDP are both uh, quite progressive. Although, from a uh, XR perspective, they're going too slow. You know, it's, it should be faster and stronger. Uh, and then there's Trade Justice PEI, which is uh, working in trade justice, but also for uh, uh, working against climate change. And we're going to be doing some 
coordinated activities with the Council of Canadians and um, Trade Justice PEI in the next uh, month or so. There are some logos. There's a fantastic mural that's in England. This is Greta. Our house is on fire and the water is rising. Okay, so this, uh, hmm. okay, our demands of governments to tell the truth and then act as if they believe it. Okay, that puts it pretty bluntly. And these are the events that are coming up. So basically just to come back to tell the truth and act as if you believe it, like how Canada declared climate emergency and then the next day they printed the pipeline and like how they're not really acting on what they said. So we did get Canada to declare climate emergency but we're not actually doing anything as like an emergency would ask for. Basically. Yes, and the same thing happened with the city of Charlottetown. I was in the room when they made the declaration of a climate emergency in Charlottetown, and in the same meeting, they voted down the, uh, the bike lane. The Fitzroy bike lane. Fitzroy. And they also voted against electric, buying electric buses. So, Actually, that was done by uh, some politicians. They left it off to the private well, there. Oh, yeah, that's true, right? Yeah, but I mean, the, the fault there with the politicians is none of them have said a word about it. No. None of the green, not a single politician has said anything negative. It's, it's just astounding. Yeah. Well, let's get on the greens. Yeah, yeah well, let's. Yeah. That's yeah. hard. Yeah, but, well, yeah. there used to be me kind of a gag fly. So. Uh, oh, yeah, so the events. Right? Yeah, okay, right. Then um, there's going to be a critical mass. We're doing critical mass. Has anybody, has anybody heard of critical masses? There's something happening around the world in cities where people get together and bike in large numbers all at the same time, going the same direction, the same route, in order to uh, pressure the city governments to have proper, uh, proper uh, infrastructure to make it safe to bike. Like, uh, PEI has a lovely system of bike trails if you want to go from tip to tip. But if you want to get around uh, Charlottetown, you're taking your life in your hands. I know I do it every day. <laughs> um, okay, so every the, the last Friday of every uh, month, we're doing the critical mass, and every Friday we're meeting in front of the private's house and doing this is traditional type. Uh, demonstration. It's not really non-violent direct action. We are not uh, like stopping traffic or doing anything like that because of uh, some things in our, our history. Uh, we've, we've sort of dialed it back after uh, some unpleasantness. But we're hoping that we can get people together who are willing to actually make a sacrifice. I myself am willing to get arrested. I, uh, I, of course, I'm very privileged. I, uh, I'm retired. I don't have to work. Nobody's going to fire me. Uh, I understand that it's not every, not everyone is in that sort of position. But yes. So, like for example, I'm also involved in Extinction Rebellion, but I'm not willing to get it arrested because I work in the school system, and that would kind of mean that I couldn't work. Anymore, so everyone we basically just ask everyone to contribute like as far as they're comfortable. Of course, it's nice to have a couple of people who are willing to get arrested. Then we have like large yeah. say. But even just being part of the mass, being part of that crowd that is gathering, is very important. So yeah, and we can sort of push against the boundary, right? It's not necessarily uh, you know that distinct. We can. Uh, for people who don't, you know, don't want to do anything too extreme, we can find ways that they can express themselves, uh, or they can support the people who are willing. Now, one thing is, and we, this has our, been our experience in the past, that when one person gets arrested, it really doesn't have the kind of effect that we need to have, because that one person is just tagged as crazy. And so, really, I. I don't want to waste being arrested, right? <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm willing to sacrifice myself.
in order to, to push things, to make change, but not just to be labeled as, as a crazy, right? So uh, I would love it if anybody else was uh, willing to come out, uh, as people are around the world and around Canada too. I mean, there's a long tradition also among the Aboriginal peoples of facing the, uh, the power of the state uh, in order to uh, express their rights. Or and we're still here. Hmm? And we're still here. Still here. Still here. Yeah. And growing strong. Things are going in the right direction, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, September 20th and 27th, there are. It's still a bit confusing in that, globally speaking, the 20th is a global school strike, supposedly. This is Greta's thing. Uh, and the 27th is supposed to be a, glo a global strike, climate strike, of adults, of people actually striking from work. Okay? And these things are going to, in some places in the world, they're going to be uh, very extensive like in the UK. In the UK, there are 100,000 people who have given their names and signed up to uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, who identify as members of Extinction Rebellion. 100,000, right? And it's growing in many parts of the world, even in the States. So, uh, maybe we can grow here. I would like to at least show some solidarity you know, to say, okay, well, they can do these big things in other places, maybe we can do a little thing here, because we're a little place. Uh, so, and then, on this October 7th, there's a big Extinction Rebellion thing around the world, where they're going to basically hold London hostage again. Oh, so I thought it was just Canada, so it's all around the world. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're, London's going to be big, huge. They've got 100,000 people. Um, and in Canada as well, and the Canadian uh, XR has decided on this idea of having a bridge out. Now they're doing it at many different bridges in, in important cities, uh, which is to, to block a bridge. Now uh, this idea has not gone over very well, even with people who are committed to ex Extinction Rebellion. Actually blocking a bridge, people are worried about uh, uh, having a negative reaction from people. Um, but what we are thinking of doing, and uh, this is still in the works, and if you want to join us and discuss what the tactics should be, we would really welcome your, your thoughts. Um, we're thinking of having a sort of stakeout, of uh, being on the uh, Hillsborough Bridge, of uh, being in the, uh, the pedestrian uh, lane, and of uh, showing signs or... Yeah, and basically like everyone would pull the sign, but we would also ask the cars to slow down because, you know, like someone basically... So instead of closing down the bridge, we would basically just slow down. Okay. Right. Well, there's one member that's extremely anxious about people getting hurt. She has visions of but, horror. But, uh, so, we could have somebody out on, in front of each lane saying, please slow down. Yeah, like, the, you right. know, how you have the constructions on the road and there's yeah. one guy standing there with slow down or stop or everything. We can also have that and just basically ask the cars to go at 40 kilometers per hour or something so that it's not becoming mm -hmm. thing dangerous. And they also have time to read our signs. Yeah. Way, yeah. So. so this is happening, uh, as far as I know, in every uh, province except for Newfoundland. There's not really a... There's no extinction rebellion in Newfoundland, not at all. Not yet. As far as we know. But all the other provinces, like Nova Scotia, Ontario, so, uh, they have So, as far as extinction rebellion around the world, it's in India, it's in many African countries, there was Extinction Rebellion uh, demonstration in Antarctica. So, it's pretty universal. Um, so, I think that's the end of my talk. There's also, I think Mike, if you want to talk about the signs. Yeah. We will have some signs, so that's also happening in September. Yes, uh, 
possibly as early as this Friday, uh, commission some signs for lawns and for uh, windows. So people could, uh, we're going to make those available at cost for people to purchase. Uh, there's a campaign, a couple of campaigns going on right now. One of them the pipe in the straight with pulp mill and picto. You see those around. And they've, uh, they've generated a lot of interest and solidarity through Nova Scotia and people. And uh, also in Nova Scotia, they're trying to revive gold mining in watersheds, which is arsenic through watersheds. <laughs> so if you go over there, you'll see those. And they uh, really create community because people see the sign and they start discussing with their neighbors what it's about. And in our community, of course, this problem is worldwide. And we all have an interest in it. And uh, these signs would be self-supporting, the long ones. And hopefully it would sell for $8. And so it's not, you can let your opinion know, and yet you don't have to be in the street all the time. Where would they be available? Um, well, we're going to have some, uh, either this Friday or next Friday, Fridays for Future. I'm willing to deliver <laughs> them here walking this into the caravan. But we're thinking maybe going to getting permission maybe from some farmers markets or word of mouth. Um, yeah, it's basically gonna say climate emergency act now. Yes. So and that week of the twentieth to twenty seventh, we're gonna probably have some pop up uh, exhibitions of those signs around Charlottetown. And people could if they see that they could stop and hope they buy them. Yeah, so the lawn signs about approximately eight dollars, and the ones for windows, which aren't weather durable, but uh, two or three dollars.